Hi everyone, it's Ellie from The Curious Geographer, and in this video we are going to go over the Global Systems Global Governance Unit, which is the ACOA specification linked to globalisation. Hopefully you'll find this really useful. A lot of you have requested it. So um, if you haven't already checked out the Changing Places video, then please do. I'll put a comment below so you can click onto that. It follows the same structure. So I have used the specification to make the mind maps and hopefully this can be used to complement your revision. So you can add further detail with different case studies and examples that you know, which you've been taught in your lessons. You'll also see that I am using specifications and you'll see the numbers from the specifications as well. And I kind of show how I make my mind maps and how, about, how I go about doing this revision. So hopefully this can be useful as just some revision tips um, and techniques that you can use with some of your other topics as well. Okay, so first we are going to start with the mind map and we are going to look at globalization, which is 3.2.11 on the specification. Um, you'll actually see that I did make this mind map a little bit too big, um, so I do shrink it down. So if you are copying this, this is on an A3 piece of paper, but leave some gaps around the side as I'm going to add the other part of the specification, global systems, which is 3.212, also on the side. So we're going to start first of all with a defin definition of globalisation. So globalisation is the growing interdependence of countries worldwide or it is the increasing connectivity of people and places. And is, it is the interdependence or connectivity which is really important about globalisation. So it's how countries and people are connecting across the globe. So interdependence means rely on each other and interdependence is a key um, terminology in the A-level specification. So it's really important that we know what that means, but we are going to be coming back to it again in this mind map as well. So when we think about globalisation, um, there are many like factors of globalization um, or like strands of globalization. So we have social, economic, cultural and political. It's not just kind of our products that we get from one area to another. There are different types which we're going to go into. So social would be kind of families being able to connect instantly. For example, it might be over FaceTime. The fact that you might have friends around the globe and you can speak to them instantly. That's a form of globalization. Economic is obviously our transnational corporations and kind of goods being bought and shared from across the world. Cultural might be kind of sharing of foods and kind of cultural practices, um, and they're kind of almost sometimes becoming a global community we can talk about. And also political is when countries come together, for example, with international agreements. Just a note on the side, globalisation is not a new process. So globalisation, we've always been connected with places around the world for a really long time. Um, that I've actually made a video on what globalisation is. So, um, for example, we were connected um, east to west with the Silk Roads, which was an ancient network of trade routes from um, kind of like through China and Asia. However, it is the speed of which globalisation is occurring, which has increased. So basically, we are becoming more and more instantly connected with people and places, whereas before we weren't as connected to places. And we're going to be looking at the reasons for that. This is also called time-space compression, and we're going to come back to this in a second as well. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the dimensions of globalisation. So as I said, I am following the specification, so if you have it along the side, you'll see that I'm using the same terminology, because this is sometimes what comes up in the exam, so it's really important that we get used to it. So flows of globalisation are things which are move around the world. So it's kind of what connects people and places. So we can have different flows and also just a little exam tip is there are sometimes lots of graphs. You might have kind of um, line graphs or maps like flow diagrams that show these as well. So um, if you can have a look at some resources, then they'll be really good as well. I'll show you one when we're thinking about migration. So there's flows of capital, labour, products and um, services and information. So I'm going to go through what each of these are. And again, as I said, like this terminology is on the specification. So it might be often there's like a full mark question on what these mean. So it's really important to know which each one is. Flows of capital usually refers to money going around the world. For example, investment, trade or production. So you can have different types of money um, moving around the world, some of which can include FDI, which is foreign direct investment, repatriation of profits, aid and remittances. So for example, FDI, foreign direct investment, there's seen an increase. So for example, in 1996, there was $400 billion invested into kind of countries um, or companies. And in 2016, there was $1,500 billion. So you can see there's been a massive increase. And we're going to be looking at 
the patterns of investment in the next kind of topic to do with it as well. Repatriations of profits. This basically means that, for example, for TNCs or transnational corporations, they might invest in an area, but then the profits are kind of brought back to the TNC. So they kind of bring back the profit profits to a country. And again, we've kind of got mo- movement of capital around the world. Aid, for example, the World Bank as an international organisation, it gives out loans to countries to develop. Um, remittances might be that migrants are moving from one area to work as an economic migrant and they are sending money back to their families back at home. So when we're talking about movements of labour, we are mainly talking about people moving around the world um, as migrants. So this can be kind of national and international, and particularly over with globalisation, international migration has massively increased. I was talking about these diagrams, and here is a kind of image of migration changing over different times. So, um, and you can look at the flows around the world, so you can see there's been like an increase in international migration. So these are ones which are really good to practice your interpretation skills. So economic migrants go to place and money, and then usually they will send home remittances, which can support the families at home. So one example where this has happened, and it's quite good if you do have little examples through each, for each of these movements, is many, um, particularly young men, have moved from Nepal to the Gulf, um, or like Middle Eastern countries. In fact, 25% of Nepal's GDP in 2014 came from remittances being sent home. And some people kind of say, actually, maybe this is a better way for Nepal to develop because they're not relying on aid. Um, And in fact, apparently, when I looked up the facts for this um, on Nepal, in 2014, 16,000 young men left each month Nepal um, to move to become a, a migrant to the um, to the Gulf countries. So I just ran out of room a little bit, so I'm just going to move um, products um, to the other side of services and information. So by services and information services, we kind of mean, we're talking about kind of tertiary service. Um, so if you think about industry, primary, secondary, tertiary, so kind of these are your economic activities, including, say, banking. And there's particularly a lot more kind of services around the world today as to kind of technology has increased. But also in the 1970s, there was deregulation of financial markets. So this basically kind of opens up the markets for lots of investment globally. Um there are different types of services you might kind of have high level um, including like banking um, which usually and not always occur in like HICs however you can also have low level um, of kind of services um, where you don't require say as much kind of education etc and such as customer services and so for example Bangalore um, had um, VT moved all their call centers over there I think they've actually been moved back now Bangalore is in India and there was a lot of um, kind of tech industry over there as well when we're talking about information we're kind of talking about data so this can be financial or for example like the news that we see Um, information can be shared via email the internet social media and today, like you know that you can send large amounts of data and they can be shared kind of instantly across the world. So this has kind of, there's a lot of information kind of flowing all around the world. And products, so these are our goods, um, like kind of capital goods. Um, we're going to be looking at trade um, as well, but previously most kind of trade um for goods might have been kind of between HICs. However, with the global shift, which is basically the movement of manufacturing across to Asia, there's a lot of production and cheaper production in Asia and NEEs. So basically, like the making of goods and products has mean the means the world is much more kind of connected as places are relying on each other to make products and then they sell them in different places as well. So China is actually the largest manufacturing country. Um, Many of you probably could have guessed that. And in 2018, they kind of made 28% of all goods kind of globally. So that's almost a third of all goods being made and in China. Okay, so I'm briefly going to talk about global marketing here, simply because it's on, on the specification um, in this place. However, it mainly links with TNCs. So kind of use this, but me might want to refer to it later. So global marketing is the kind of promoting and selling um, of products and services. Um, it's basically like the world is viewed as one market so and companies can have a global brand so basically one good sold all over the world so for example coca-cola 
um, is pretty much the same like wherever it is around the world and this basically means there's good scales of production so basically they can kind of scale up how much they produce and then also they can in different places use like comparative advantage so if you do economics actually um or business studies then some of this might link with kind of understanding the kind of global economy through those subjects as well um you don't have to get too technical for kind of a level geography but it's just knowing that if you specialize in a product then you can produce more of it and then you can make more profit Another thing which kind of links to this, but people could actually say this is potentially the opposite of a global brand, is globalization. I think this is so um, cool when you look at different examples. So these are products which are adapted to suit a certain location. So for example, McDonald's, um, if you go to different places around the world, they'll have different like menus. So for example, India, they don't have beef because it's sacred. And um, they have like kind of tikka burgers as well and also like spiderman you'll see that in india he is called peter like he's got a different name um i can't remember what it's called but he basically kind of goes around he's dressed in indian clothes as well because for, stu- for children looking up they are much likely to admire or watch a comic of someone who like dresses maybe like um in clothes that are familiar to them so localization is when you have a product and you change it to the um to the population so they can um they might buy more of it so as i said it's kind of like the opposite of global brand but lots of tncs do use this in order to increase their sales okay so next we're going to look at patterns of production distribution and consumption so this is actually all on the same line of the specification so do make sure if you are kind of going along the specifications that you do kind of divide each kind of word means because they are all kind of very different and also quite important um so i actually find it useful to draw a table kind of thinking about how this has changed over time so looking at past present and future so for example the production of many goods previously in manufacturing used to be made in hic's this was pretty much because um through the industrial revolution many hic countries for example the uk and the us went um increased their manufacturing um and for example, cars mainly were made in Detroit, um, which is a big case study you might have studied as well. And also, for example, textiles, Leicester in the UK. Um, when we're looking at trade, also, you can kind of start to bring in ideas and um, start to talk about kind of col- um, colonisation and how HICs have used colonies from other countries to for their own advantage and basically meant that some countries have stayed like massively underdeveloped as well because they've just been exploited. So... Um, We'll, we can, we'll talk about that a bit later as well. Production used to be, if we kind of talk about HICs, and consumption also would be in HICs. So the products would kind of be made in the same place as where they are consumed. So production obviously is where something's made, distribution is how it moves across the world, and consumption is where um, they use the products. However, through deindustrialization, and that's quite important because this is quite a big shift which has changed the patterns of production and um, patterns of production mainly. So through deindustrialization and the global shift, or some people call it the Asian shift, where manufacturing has moved to China um, or Asia, um, one reason for this might be China's open door policy, where they had lots of special economic zones and encouraged a lot of manufacturing through kind of open good policies um, and TNCs wanted to invest in them. So if we have a look at present today and through deindustrialization, where many factories have been closed, so... Detroit is an example where there's been many factories that have been closed, the car industry has kind of moved out and there was a massive like um, population decline. If you've also learned about this in Changing Places, it's a really good synoptic link between the two units. Many um, areas of production now are LICs and um, NEEs, um, for example China, which we looked at before. However, consumption is still predominantly in HICs, However, it is also increasing in NEEs. So particularly China does have a massive growing middle class. And um, this means that a lot of the products they make are also consumed within the same place. And then I think it's quite important to think about what's happening with the future of production. So you would have seen kind of Trump's kind of making America great again. And so will production go back to HICs as places are trying to encourage more jobs? Just a question to think about. Will maybe production move, say, from an example like Asia and China to maybe Africa as China invests in Africa? Um, so 
I mean, I don't know the answer, but it's something for you to think about. And then also kind of any yeast, there is also massively growing populations in HICs. We do kind of have declining populations and people are trying to be a bit more sustainable. Like, is that enough to impact the consumption um, patterns around the world? Again, something for you to think about. And then mainly distribution, and we're going to be talking about the changes in technology, but particularly present containerization has a massive impact on how much how products are moved around the world um, so yeah containerization as I said we will talk about in the kind of technology um, aspects but that is how many products are moved across the world another thing to think about um, with deindustrialization as I said linking to the change of places unit is kind of what have been the impacts of this the social economic and environmental impacts but then also we've mainly talked about the production of goods or products but you can also think about the production of services so we briefly talked about services before so many of these are made in hubs in HICs so for example kind of techie areas such as kind of Silicon Valley but there's also areas which you talked about say Bangalore and India so you can think about where is their growth of new services so for example China is actually somehow they are reducing their manufacturing and actually they are increasing the amount of services this actually kind of impacts how much emissions they are in releasing into the um, atmosphere as well, thinking about CO2, but that's kind of a separate topic. But yeah, so think about products and also services. Okay, so that's the kind of dimensions of globalization and the first line of the specification. Um, you can see why this is going to take quite a bit of time, but I will try and be quick. Um, next, we're going to have a look at the factors of globalization. So we're going to be talking about the development of technologies, systems and relationships, including financial, transport, security, communications, management and information systems and then also trade agreements trade agreements is like a separate big part but um we'll first we'll talk about kind of the idea of technology so technology is really important when we think about globalization and the factors in globalization so technology has led to the shrinking world effect where basically the world feels smaller as it's more connected so for example if we think about communication or travel to australia before if you wanted to communicate with someone in australia and i've made a video on this time space compression um then you'd have to you could use like morse code or you have to travel by ship and it would take you like four months or something ridiculous like that whereas now you can facetime and see people instantly or you can get on a plane and you can see people still a very long time but within 12 hours um and basically this connectivity with people from really far areas around the world makes us makes the world feel smaller and makes us all feel closer and this was a term coined by janelle and also harvey and transport and it have been fundamental in the shrinking world effect which we will come to in a second so next we're going to talk about systems and relationships so these are particularly systems when we're thinking about kind of financial systems and also kind of companies around so these are ways of working particularly across borders remember across borders globalization um, so, for example, if you think about the term just in time production, this basically means that we kind of get products instantly and kind of everything is delivered um, kind of simultaneously and it's all very efficient. Um, however, this also requires a very efficient ordering system and reliability. So, for example, it is managed through ICT. So kind of you'll, you'll be able to buy something online and a factory will then get some information and then it will be sent and blah, 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 blah. And that is all very efficient. So that's very important in order to make us feel like very connected and also have this kind of instant like flow of goods and products. If we next talk about financial, um, so kind of financial systems, we are talking about global financial systems that govern the flow of capital around the world. So these, um, we talked about capital moving around the world can be in many different forms, but these um, players include investors, governments, banks, companies, and international organizations. These are all part of the global, global financial system. Um, you also have kind of the World Trade Organization, which we'll come to, so if you don't know who they are, just wait a um, second, um, and also the World Bank as well. So these are all important organizations for um, investing in different areas around the world. As I said before, um, when we kind of, in the 1980s, we had deregulation of markets, which basically there's more investment, and this has meant that capital is kind of freely, like this free flow of capital around the world. This also links to, and I'll come back to this in a second, the idea of neoliberal policies. So neoliberal policies is that kind of idea that we um, are encouraging free trade um, and that places can invest in different areas around the world and that will encourage that economic growth. Now that people argue is a very Western view of trade and development, but that is what many of these organisations such as the World Trade Organisation are promoting. They're promoting neoliberal policies 
um, and saying that basically we can we can put money around the world and this will ultimately mean that everybody can develop fairly. When we talk about transport, we are talking about two key forms of transport which have been very influential influential in um, globalization. So container ships and air travel. So a container ship is a standardized transport system. So you want to go and know what they look like. They're those large steel containers. And basically what they can do is they move between ships, trains and lorries. So you don't have to kind of unpack something then to put it on a ship. It just moves all instantly. And if you have a look at some of the container shipyards like around the world, they are huge. Um, and these basically reduce transport times and they reduce costs because it's much more efficient. So this will contribute to economic globalization as things can be transported, goods can be transported around the world very quickly and effectively. You'll also know if you've kind of watched um, any programs on it um, that there's obviously massive issues because they all can't be scanned. This is a bit of a side note. Um, there's many ways how, many examples how kind of drugs or illegal goods can come into an area, um, come into a country, just because the quantity of container ships there are in the world means they physically can't kind of check every contents. However, they do track them around the world. So there's also some container ship maps which you can see cargo moving around the world, which is quite cool air transport so this can also increase the speed of delivery of goods but obviously it's quite expensive if you are kind of flying goods over by air and um, so that's economic globalization but it is mainly the increased activity of cheap flights that has led to an increased number of tourists and also migrants um, which contributes to social and political globalization so as people or flows of labor are moving around the world air transport has massively facilitated this um, and even, again, kind of a link to changing places as well might have led to decline in, say, seaside resorts as well, as more people are likely to go on a cheap holiday to Spain rather than stay in the UK because it costs like the same amount sometimes as a plane to get over there as it does the train to get to a coastal area in the UK. So security is a really interesting one. And again, like... Um, Make sure you do know these because there was a full mark question on exam paper about this um, and a lot of students I taught got a bit stumped with it because they just kind of moved past it when they were doing their revision. So security can contribute, but it can also limit globalisation, which kind of goes for each the same one of these, of these. The more there is, maybe the more it can contribute, but here it kind of changes a bit. So countries work together to increase security of transport networks for example I talked about the containers and this includes laws to reduce legal trade of goods um, and this means that many countries can trade goods and there can be a flow of products and capital around the world however security can also limit globalization so as countries tighten security and migration policies this can restrict the flow of people so we clearly know this with kind of migration policies like so not um, everybody is Kind of welcome in different countries um, and you have to have visas and this means that there's not a kind of free flow of people around the world okay so communications next this is basically how we are encouraging people to communicate and feel connected across the globe so in the 1960s lots of satellites um, meant that there was wireless communication with people around the world the rise of the internet has also been extremely important so as i said before if you wanted to contact someone across the world you probably have to use morse code or you have to write a letter it would take forever whereas now you can have instant phone calls and use video chat and you can use it across the internet and for a lot of people it's really low prices there are also submarine um, communication cables which are really cool so if you have a look at, on a map online um, you can see kind of on, on the seabed how there's um, different cables which basically um, are telecommunication signals and which are across the sea floor so um, to be honest I didn't even really know about them until I started teaching about it so definitely check that one out but that's really important for our communication across the world um, and also lots of financial kind of things being sold and financial transactions of money also kind of go through these different like cables um, and people communicate with satellites so therefore communications will increase social globalization and also economic through capital and flows and also political because um, countries can easily commute communicate with each other and then we have management and information systems so this is kind of similar to what we talked about before with the system so this is basically making companies efficient so global supply chains and we'll talk about this when we get to tnc's is really important this is the networks of kind of tnc's kind of around the world so for example they might have raw materials from one area it might be manufactured in another area and it might be sold in another area so countries can specialize in certain production and as i said previously this can 
increased kind of comparative advantage, which basically means if you specialize in one product and sell it, then you have an advantage um, as you have kind of create economies of scale. This can mean there is low cost and also maximum profit. However, when we're talking about kind of management and information systems of TNCs, we can also think about outsourcing and offshoring. So offshoring is when you move your company abroad and this will be included in that kind of global supply chain. So for example, your factories might be moved to an area where there is cheaper labor so you can make the maximum amount of profit. But also outsourcing is employing another country um, or actually company really to carry out a section of your work. So for example, if we talk about call centers, if you wanted to employ a different company to carry them out, so then you wouldn't have to put all those kind of systems in place or different management, then you can get a company to specialize in that. Make sure you do know the difference between outsourcing and offshoring. They often get mixed up. So just go over and put those two words down, highlight them so you know the difference. Trade agreements. This is basically countries grouping together to um, govern the flow of products. So it might be um, goods, it might be also different flows from around the world, including labor, for example, the movement of people. You also have some key players in global trade. We mentioned before the WTO, World Trade Organization, the IMF, and also the World Bank, which we'll talk about more in a second. There's different types of how countries can group together, and there's different amounts of kind of integration. So if you think about if something is fully integrated, that means that a lot of things are very similar, whereas if they're not as integrated, um, they might just have some kind of links together or some policies to together. So for example, a free trade area eliminates internal barriers but maintains independent external barriers. So basically what this means is that countries can trade freely with each other so they don't have to pay any taxes or tariffs. So basically if they want to export some of their goods or if a country wants to import um, another country's goods, they don't have to pay lots of fees. Um, however, you also have customs unions, common markets and also political unions. So a customs market is the same as above, so they eliminate internal barriers. However, they have one common external barrier. So if you're wanting to trade with an area, so for example, this is an example of the EU, um, then they have they just pay one external barrier, um, one external like tariff, and it's all kind of very similar. You also have a common market, which also includes the free movement of resources. So for example, people, and also um, with among member countries. And then you also have political unions. So this is all above. So they're kind of more integrated. Um, so they have the kind of eliminates internal barriers. There's one common external barrier. You can have the free movement of kind of labor and people. And there's also a uniform set of economic policies. So all countries will kind of abide by the same rules and regulations when it comes to trade. So we have NAFTA as an example of a free trade area. Um, however, I'll talk about NAFTA in a second, being renamed to USMCA. Um, so they, for example, US, Canada and Mexico should have kind of free trade between them. However, they have different external barriers. So the US will put tariffs on different goods and it will not be the same as what Mexico does. And then you also have the EU, sorry, NAFTA stands for North American Free Trade Agreement. So that's how it'll be referred to in your books. But as I said, there is a new trade agreement, which Trump has kind of renamed it. Um, and then you also have the EU, um, which can be called a customs union, a common market and a political union. So it kind of depends on kind of which country is which, um, particularly with the euro, lots of countries kind of are in a political union. Um, but the idea is that you normally kind of have free movement of people and you also have this kind of external barrier so they are very integrated so the EU is kind of more integrated than NAFTA when we're thinking about trade agreements. Okay so there are obviously positives and negatives if you are included in a trade area and actually if you have a look at world maps normally you'll have see that trade blocks and particularly are geographically close um, and there are most countries are in a trade block with countries close to them. Um, so globally positives are that there's there should be improved global peace and cooperation because obviously if you are um, develop if you all members can develop their kind of standards in trade and also um, specialize and create kind of economies of scale and then also there should be more global peace because countries are interdependent or relying on each other and therefore um, this can mean there's kind of not different wars and kind of countries are wanting each other to kind of develop. 
Then you also have national positives. So for example, if you are part of a trade block, you might have competition against on a global level because you have more kind of influence as you're with a group of different countries. And there's also, you might be able to have increased movement of labor, kind of free movement of labor. And this can kind of increase kind of economic migration, sending remittances back home. Um, and that can improve your kind of national economy. Or you might be able to attract different people as well. So it kind of works in both ways. However, there are disadvantages. And the main disadvantages come when you have different countries who are different levels of development inside a trade block. Not always. So this can kind of um, change. But so, for example, NAFTA, and I will add this in a second at the top, it is now, as of July 2020, called USMCA. So NAFTA stood for, as I said before, North American Free Trade Agreement. And now it is United States, Mexico, Canada. So it's just kind of reworked. No one's been added to it, but it's Trump's doings. Um, So what we've had with kind of NAFTA is that because the labour was cheaper in Mexico, because kind of wages weren't as high as kind of US citizens, um, then they would set up these factories called Macrodorias. Um, I probably said that wrong, but basically they would be factoring on the border. So the companies would kind of get factories just across from Mexico, just across the border where labor was cheaper. And they would basically try and get as much profit from their companies as possible. Um, but obviously there might be kind of US companies um, which are kind of exploiting the cheaper Mexico, Mexican labor. So if is it fair that because you're on a trade block that you're using or exploiting different um, countries? And that's kind of what happened as well. And then also this kind of conflict can be caused. So many people in the US have argued that since NAFTA has occurred, there has been um, jobs have been stolen because there's cheaper labor. So if you're thinking about deindustrialization and the car industry, however, other people argue that's actually just to do with the rise of technology, that as technology has increased, um, labor isn't needed. And that has actually caused the job lost. And there's a few good videos if you have a look on YouTube, kind of thinking about NAFTA in a burger or um, as a car. So that kind of illustrates how places are connected. So now I think it's quite a good time to talk about Brexit. So Brexit was obviously the UK leaving the EU. So some people argue that because trade blocks um, and um, trade agreements encourage globalisation, that Brexit is actually an example of deglobalisation. And um, there's kind of a few magazines and articles which talked about this. The Economist talks about this um, as well. So... Yeah, if trade blocks connect countries, then here the UK is separating from the EU. So is that an argument against trade blocks or also just even to think about what are the benefits of trade blocks when we're thinking about them as a factor of globalisation? Then also it's really important to think about new trade agreements. So if you have a look at um, trade blocks, normally they are countries that are geographically close. So for example, we've got NAFTA, there's trade blocks um, kind of in Asia as well. Um, South America has a different trade block the EU obviously however that's primarily because places it was easier to trade with places that are close to you and you might be able to kind of contact them and kind of make negotiations more easy easily um however we can now have trade agreements from across the world as we talked about kind of information services everything is so instantly connected around the world so one example of a trade agreement is the EU and Japan so this was an economic partnership in February 2019 And this basically removes tariffs. Tariffs has two Fs, by the way, um, to encourage trade. So kind of, and this kind of happened as Brexit was happening. So kind of the EU were like, oh, we don't have the UK, but let's make a trade agreement with Japan. Um, And so basically they are having kind of trying to encourage more free trade between them so they can each improve their economies or um, increase their levels, um, their economic development through trade. You then also have the TTIP and the TPP. So the TTIP is the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which was the EU and US. Um, This was to encourage trade between them. However, this has not been signed. And also the TPP, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which has been signed in 2014. This includes kind of Australia, Brunei, Canada, Chile, Japan, Malaysia, New Zealand, Peru, Singapore, Vietnam, and the US. So kind of your Pacific countries both sides um, of the ocean. However, it is not in force yet. So I definitely keep an eye out depending on when you take your exams, what's happening with these new trade deals. But it was really important to think about that it's not just trade blocks and it's not just countries that are geographically close. It is also um, countries um, around the world that are also creating different agreements. 
Okay, so that is the whole of the first bit of globalization. Um, you'll see that I made it a little bit big, so I've just put it like a little bit to the side of my sheet. So we're now going to talk about global systems, which is three, two, one, two. Um, we're not going to talk about all of it, and I'll talk um, about that why. It's just that some of the spec is actually massively repeated, and it's much easier for you to think about the challenges or the negative parts of globalization once you have a more com comprehensive overview of the other sections. A massive part of this part of the specification is talking about the word interdependence, which we talked about before. So when we think about interdependence, we can talk about, we talk about how countries rely on each other, economic, political, social, and environmentally. So countries rely on each other for economic growth, as we talked about with trade, trade agreements, and trade blocks. They now um, require each other. They might have also a global network um companies might have a global systems network around the world where they might have products manufactured but sold in different areas you then also have obviously political so kind of any global issues climate change covid19 countries might be working together um, and therefore they're relying on each other for example a vaccine or um, climate change solutions social migration um, countries are very interdependent as well and also kind of environment Okay, so I've written down the dependency theory, which I want to talk about um, to you to explain a bit about it. But then also with interdependence, obviously it can be very positive if countries are interdependent and in a globalised world. However, this can also create inequalities. And when we talk about inequality, we want to think about between and within countries. So there can be benefits to some countries. However, flows of people, capital and ideas are unequal. And so basically this whole part of this topic is thinking about what are the benefits of being interdependent? However, what are the, what are the disadvantages of having this, these unequal flows? And how does this impact different countries, but also different people within one country? So I think the dependency theory is a really interesting diagram um, to think about when we're looking at interdependence. Some people look at it, um, some specifications look at it, for example, if you're looking at Excel and kind of superpowers units, looking at kind of geopolitical implications. It is a simplified diagram. Um, however, it does show the interdependence of different countries. So if you think about core countries and periphery countries, so core would be, kind of be your HIC countries um, and periphery would be your LICs or NEE ones. So core, which in kind of the center of economic activity. Um, again, as I said, this is, this is simplified. Um, you kind of have flows going between the different ones and this can show how places are interdependent. So for example, in your periphery countries, they might be sending raw materials or kind of low value goods. Skilled migrants, as people move to kind of the core to kind of make money, um, they might, if HIC or core countries are kind of giving out loans to periphery countries and the periphery countries will be sending interest back, paid on loans, also, core cool countries might be sending aid, but then also they can be sending their waste. And we'll talk about e-waste kind of at the end when we're looking at environmental issues of globalization. So you can kind of see here how there's a flow of different goods between the kind of poor and periphery countries, um, core and periphery. And I just think it's quite important for us to think about how different flows occur between different countries and also how different countries might rely on each other. So for example, the core countries might want the skilled migrants and encourage migrations to their area. They might not want them. Um, but yeah, as I said, it's just quite good to think about and you can read up about it if you want to learn more about the dependency theory. Okay, so next I want to talk a little bit about global governance and particularly international organizations and I wanna break them down and define them so we know exactly what they are and kind of how they work. Um, so global governance is the emergence of norms, rules and laws and institutions that have kind of regulated global systems. So when we're thinking about flows of goods, etc. The key one is the UN and it's actually linked to many of the other international organisations. So the United Nations was set up in 1945 and this is quite a key day actually because it was after World War II and it was to promote growth and stability and also maintain international peace. So after the war, many countries had spent a lot of money on the war um, and were financially quite crippled. And basically the UN was set up to kind of promote prosperity and growth and stability. And within the UN, there are now um, 193 members who are in the General Assembly, which is kind of one country, one, one vote. However, you also have the Security Council. And when you're evaluating the UN, this is quite important to really think about. So the UN and the Security Council kind of has these five permanent members, and these were actually the winners of World War II. So there's the UK, USA, France, Russia, and China. And basically what these countries do, they have this power of veto. And this basically means that if something is going to go through, they can say, like, no, I don't want it to go through. One of them can say it and it will stop them. Whereas 
not everyone, not every country of the 193 members has that power, only five of them, and they're also the winners of the World War II. So um, just think about it, like, is that fair or is that some countries using their power in global systems and global institutions to kind of influence decision making across the globe? I'm not going to give the answer, but I'm going to get you just to think about that. Um, then you also have 10 non-permanent members, which are elected for two years, but they don't have the power of veto. So it's quite an interesting dynamic. So the UN peacekeeping force is basically like the UN's army, but not really, it's meant, obviously it's meant to be like peacekeeping. So there's over 100,000 field personnel. So basically people who go, they're called the blue helmets because they have blue, and hel blue UN helmets um, and they aim to promote peace. Um, it's really interesting because actually, um, and it's probably because some of these places don't have massive kind of international armies like NATO, which the US has. 80% um, of the field personnel are actually from LICs or NEEs, particularly Ethiopia and Bangladesh have some of the highest, make up some of the highest proportions of kind of field, um, people on the ground. Then you also have the UN organs. So for example, the UNDP and UNICEF, so that's to do with children, and also the specialised agency. So these are, for example, the... FAO, IMF, WHO, WTO, so World Health Organization, International Monetary Fund, World Trade Organization, Food and Agriculture Organization. So these are all kind of part of the UN family. However, they are also independent international organizations. So they kind of do have their own kind of their headquarters are based in different areas as well. But it's quite interesting because they are actually kind of linked with that specialized agency of the UN. If we have a look at the World Bank, WTO and IMF in a bit more detail, I have mentioned them already a few times. So the World Bank, there are 185 members per number of countries and they are an important source of financial aid and technical assistance to developing countries. Their main aim is to reduce poverty. The World Trade Organization deals with the global rules of trade between nations and helps to resolve disputes. So basically they say, um, whether or they will like negotiate about tariffs or if countries want to are going to have embargoes, etc. Um, the International Monetary Fund regulates the global economy and advises governments on development. It also gives out loads to support economic development. So that, for example, they might encourage a country to develop by opening up their economy. Now it's really important to think about that all of these countries, and I mentioned this earlier about neoliberalization, they all encourage neoliberal policies, um, which is basically free trade. So they kind of think that if the economy or the world is open up for free trade, then everybody can specialize and then countries can develop. However, this is um, sometimes deemed as a very Western view and like yeah, neoliberal ideas and actually should, should these views be asserted on other countries. It's also really important to be evaluative of how successful they are. Um, so for example, SAPs are structural adjustment programs. And these are basically policies countries must follow in order to qualify for from a loan from the World Bank or IMF. So they won't just, the IMF will, um, won't just give like a free loan for a country to develop. Um, they will say you have to open up certain services um, and for like free market privatization, which basically means they can be invested in from another country and the government isn't in control of them. So for example, this happened in Bolivia in 2000, they received a loan and the water was privatized and actually the price doubled. Uh, I think like a French company came in and there was lots of riots and national strikes because obviously it impacted the population hugely. Um, it's also happened in kind of Tanzania, but many places around. So if you can have an example of where a structural adjustment program has impacted a place, it's quite good to evaluate how effective or how fair you think the World Bank, um, IMF and these international organisations are. I'm going to talk about next kind of global inequality. So we mentioned about how unequal flows of goods around the world can cause inequality between and within countries. So the Gini index measures the level of inequality of income distribution within a country. And it's based on the Lorenz curve, which I'm just going to draw here. Um, so basically, this is a diagram which looks, so you're looking within a country, you're looking at the percentage of income, which is on the y-axis going up, and the percentage of population, which is on the x-axis. So basically, a um, if you are on the line, 
then you have perfect equality. So the income is shared equally for the amount of people. So a score of zero income is divided equally. So for example, if we have a look at here, 50% of people earn 50% of the income. So if I'm just gonna do a drawing now. So this where I've drawn is the unequal line as it's a curve and it's not on that straight line. So here I've drawn to around 50% of the population. And you can see here that 50% of the population only own 30% of the wealth. So that is basically unequal because it means the other 50% of the population owns 70% of the wealth. So it's very unequal because surely 50% of the population should own 50% of the wealth. And um, sometimes you do get questions on this. So I'll just make sure you interpret it. You're not going to have to draw one from scratch though. We can have a look at some examples of equal and unequal places. And if you have a look at online as well, it's quite interesting to kind of see which Gini um, school places around the world have. So 0.25, 0.63, and put the UK in the middle. So Ukraine, um, can see it's, it's got, um, from like my data that I found, one of the most equal places. Um, South Africa is one of the most unequal places. And then there is the UK. So we still, you can, we know this in the UK from living in the UK that some people, um, you have millionaires who have loads of money, whereas um, there's massive areas of like inequality and you can see that within cities as well. So um, that kind of shows us that there is not an equal distribution. And you, even if you think about the world, I know this is within a country, you say that you can put all like the richest, however many people on a bus um, and they own like 50% of the wealth. It's like crazy. Oxfam has some really good visuals on this. Um, as countries develop over time, what tends to happen is there's increase in wealthy individuals. So for example, TNC owners, they might earn more money. And then what actually happens is the Gini score increases as wealth is concentrated with a few individuals. So if we have a look at globalization, while globalization might have reduced inequality between countries, as you have, for example, production is kind of through NEA, NEEs and LICs and some places getting richer and you have a look at kind of development levels, particularly Gapminder, the website is really good for this. Um, you also have increased inequality within countries. So the wealthier people are getting wealthier and then there's more kind of inequality within a country and the Gini coefficient increases. Okay, so I'm just gonna stop this part of the mind map here. So we've looked at globalization, all of the part of the specification for three, two, one, one and also global systems 32.12. Um, as you'll see, we've kind of talked about who the global systems are, but we haven't, if you look at the spec, haven't really talked about the issues associated with interdependence. Talked a little bit about it. However, in the specification, it kind of talks about how um, organizations can promote stability, growth and development, but also they can cause inequalities, conflicts and injustices. And actually, if you have a look in the spec later, when you're looking at global governance, the same wording occurs pretty much, thinking about kind of the inequalities and injustices. And also when you have a look at the globalization critique part, which is 32.16, it also talks about the benefits of globalization and the costs in terms of inequalities, injustices, conflict. So I just think it's much better if you do all of that together, once you've had a bit more understanding of the different kind of trade, etc. So we will cover everything on the specification if you're a bit worried, if we've kind of missed part out. But as I said, I will group all those bits together um, so we don't just have to keep like going over the same material and once you know a bit more so you can make a bit more of informed decisions about kind of what are the benefits and what are the challenges. This is turning into a marathon of eco-geography but hopefully you'll find this useful. Kind of feel it's better doing it more detailed. Um, let me know in the comments. Um, yeah and um, so International trade and access to markets on the specification 3213. Um, so I've actually just drawn a mind map and hopefully you can see how this is actually really helpful in your um, revision if you are also making my map similar to this. So I've literally got the specification on the side and what I can see first is that first of all it talks about trends and patterns of trade, then it's trading relationships, then it's differential access to markets. Then there's part on, which is a bit lower down, on world trade and at least one food commodity um, or manufacturing product. I'm going to be talking about bananas, but you might have a different one for this. So you can always skip on for that part. And then also there's a massive part on TNCs. So I've kind of literally made my mind map and hopefully this will work better than last time because I actually ran out of space. Um, 
So we're going to jump straight in with looking at global features and trends in the volume and patterns of international trade and investments associated with globalisation. So if we have a look at starting at the trends and patterns of trade first, trade has trade changed massively because of globalisation. We know that we've looked at some of the patterns before of production and consumption. So since the 1980s, first of all, the volume of trade has increased. So has the value. So basically we are trading more goods around the world and also like goods are high value as well. Like we know that you can get things instantly. Um, like everything in my room at the moment probably has come from China from my computer to the speaker that I'm using. Um, we also have that changing pattern of production, which we've talked about previously. So HIC, however, HICs are still the largest kind of importers um, and exporters. However, exports, particularly production, have moved to NEEs or LICs. And we looked at China being the largest exporter, particularly with that global shift. Now, the reasons for the change in patterns of trade, um, trends in trade, First of all, we have trade blocks. These have removed barriers and increased more free trade between countries. There are also what we talked about before, free market and neoliberal ideas. Um, these are promoted by your international organisations, such as the World Trade Organisation. You also have the rise of fair trade, which has maybe encouraged trade or supported trade, particularly in LICs. And also you have the rise of middle classes in NEEs, which again, we talked about when we were looking at consumption. So for example, there is now a large internal market in China. So this actually means that more products are being made, but they're also being sold internally within those countries. If we have a look now at investment, so since the 1980s, the volume of investment has massively increased and there also, also has been a changing pattern of investment. So previously it used to be more HICs to HICs um, 90, in the 1980s. However, with an open door policy in China, um, there's been more investment into LICs or NEEs. Um, and now NEEs are invited investing into some LICs or other NEEs. So for example, China has a very, um, it's developing their relationship with Africa as they're investing in many different kind of initiatives, whether that is infrastructure or kind of manufacturing as well. So when we're talking about investment, we are mainly um, with globalization talking about FDI, which is foreign direct investment. And the reasons why there has been an increasing amount of investment to do with globalization is first of all, these kind of open door policies, neoliberal ideas, um, encouraging free trade. FDI is also attracted by the size of the market, the stability of the market, and also resources and minerals. So for example, China might be investing in um, countries in Africa um, because of their minerals. Um, and then some also countries might be known for particular services, so whether that's IT services, and they also might have a lot of investment in those. And then next, if we look at trading relationships and patterns, um, and the spec asks us to look at between large, highly developed economies such as the US, the EU, and emerging economies, etc. Um, so we know that we have lots of trading relationships through international organisations. So, for example, the World Trade Organisation, the IMF, World Bank, um, and these have neoliberal ideas. They're encouraging free trade. Um, they work to increase free trade. Um, they are encouraging LICs to open up their economy and, for example, the World Bank lends money. Bear in mind, we've talked about SAPs before, um, how that can actually be a massive negative for developing countries with privatisation. We also have trade agreements and trade blocks. So trade blocks, as we know, um, depending on what time type of political integration you have, encourages free trade between groups of countries. They are usually geographically close, for example, the US or the USMCA. Here, lower tariffs create more trade, and this can encourage economies of scale. Um, however, we also did talk about this before, so however, there can be exploitation. So when trade blocks include a range of HICs and LICs, for example, the US and Mexico, some um, trade blocks um, can, countries can be exploited. We also have trade agreements for example, the EU and Japan, that is no longer geographically close. And so these trading relationships are continuing to change through our globalised world. And we also have the interesting relationship between China and Africa. So China is investing lots in Africa. It might be a railroad in um, Kenya, um, for example, Nairobi to the coast, but also in kind of the minerals there. But also like thinking about China globally, China is investing in the BRI, which is the Belt Road Initiative. 
and this is basically where they are increasing their trading routes around the world through land and sea trade routes. So for example, China is investing in ports in Pakistan, um, so they have kind of trade routes over land, it goes through Pakistan and then it goes into the sea. And China is basically, ex it's spreading its global trade. So I think that's quite interesting. If you haven't read Tim Marshall's book, Prisoners of Geography, really good to read, have a read of it. And it really talks about China's influence across the globe. So if you'll think about geopolitical influence, and this is also kind of changing our trading relationships and patterns as there are kind of different trade routes opening up globally. Differential access to markets. So this basically means how much access to markets, like how much trading and different markets where they um, consume um, products do different countries have. So how easy countries can access markets and trade with each other. This links to the idea, although it's not talked about kind of this key terminology in this specification is in Excel, about the idea of switched on to globalization or switched off. So um, and global economic hub. So if you're a kind of a global economic hub, you might be switched on to globalization. There's a, you are very globalized, your population is, you have lots of products that are being um, sold in your area, in your country. However, there are some areas which are switched off. Um, and there's say, not as much internet and um, there's not as much social, social globalization and also you can't get products from around the world. So whether you have different access to markets is affected by the following. So kind of wealth, trade blocks and location. So firstly, HICs can put high tariffs. So LICs cannot easily trade. So that can be depending on your trade blocks. And this can mean limit the access to markets some countries have. Trade blocks um, should hopefully increase access to markets. Um, and you've got your different trade blocks there as well. And location as well. So your physical geography is also quite important. So landlocked countries might actually have less access to trade and therefore um, might have less access to markets as well. We then also have economic policies that can encourage um, kind of economic globalization, such as SEZ, so special economic zones, these can encourage FDI, which means there might be a greater access to markets. So obviously, depending on variable access to markets can actually impact people's lives living around the world, which is the last point on this part of the specification. So we're going to briefly talk about this and then we'll come back to the world trade. So there are different consequences um, if you have different access to markets, so social and economic. So social consequences, if there are better access to markets, you might, there might be the opportunity of higher paying jobs and therefore people might have more disposable income. This links to the idea of like the multiplier effect as well. However, if there's poor access to market, there might be less investment into services as well, poor working conditions as countries encourage investments um, through kind of in, like having cheap labor as well. So this might mean that there's increasing amount of like sweatshops or just like poor quality working conditions. Economic. Um, consequences. If there's high access, there might be the potential for high uh, economic growth. Low access might mean the price of goods can fluctuate. There's also, um, if you have the increase of fair trade, this can also reduce social inequalities and also special um, differential treatment can give developing countries greater market access. Um, we'll talk about this later because some of it is linked to um, colonialization, which is seen through the banana trade. So world trade in a food commodity um, or manufacturing product. So yours might not be this. So if it's not, please do skip on. Um, I teach about bananas, um, but you might have done cars or coffee. So this basically can demonstrate trade issues. So bananas are mainly kind of grown in Asia, Latin America and Africa. The largest producer is are India and China. However, they also have a large internal market. The largest exporter, therefore, is Latin America and the Caribbean, because if you think about it, they're not eating all the bananas that they kind of grow, whereas India and China are. And Ecuador has 23% of the exports. The consumption is mainly um, like the EU and the US. So EU is 50% of total imports um, and the US is 18%, which is the largest country. This relationship de demonstrates that it's kind of developing countries for production and HICs are for consumption. And the trade of bananas is particularly um, dominated by TNC. So there's four, three dem 
TNCs, Chiquita you might have seen in the supermarkets. Um, they own, um, three of them own 45% of the market share. So they can influence a lot of the global trade and this can also lead to inequality in their profits um, or where money is being kind of produced and that can lead to a lot of exploitation. And you probably see that a lot of bananas are actually fair trade. So farmers um, can get more money from their products and also fair trade also not just in, gives people more money, but it also invests in like schools and healthcare facilities as well if you're part of the fair trade premium. Um, this kind of trading relationship is also kind of showing um, how colonialization um, has shaped trade patterns um, and their also globalization. So a lot of the colonies um, were would have been kind of used by their mother country um, and this basically repressed a lot of countries as well and there's still some of these trading relationships that you can see around the world today um, and this actually kind of linked to some of the trade war because the in 1989 the EU formed a special um, an SDD um, trade agreement with former colonies and the US basically pressured the world trade organizations as they thought it wasn't free trade and actually the EU therefore had to alter their rules. Um, this is quite controversial. Um, a lot of key players or key people in the WTO are kind of US, um, were US employees. And um, it just shows how the US has a lot of influence in kind of trade agreements and global institutions as well. It's so quite a few interesting things to think about. If we just talk about actually kind of trade embargoes for a second, I think it's quite an interesting kind of tangent to um, go off on. So trade wars and trade embargoes um, is basically a ban on, can be a ban on trade, and they can actually be a political move. So in 1973, there was the oil crisis where a OPEC proclaimed an oil embargo in the U on the U US. Um, and basically, this was because they weren't happy with the US influence in um, a war going on in the area. And this meant that the prices of oil in the US quadrupled. Um, you can see many times in the news now, Trump um, has, our favourite person, has put many sanctions and embargoes. Today, you might read about the US-China trade war, and they basically increased tariffs um, to um, to restrict trade from China and encourage consumers to buy American products. Um, so mainly trade embargoes are this kind of political move and this kind of like argument be like, we don't want you, we don't want your trade and we're going to impact your economy because obviously if um, China is expecting to export and make money, that's going to impact them financially as well. Um, so this does come up in other units as well, but it's just something interesting to kind of think about. TNCs. So TNCs, transnational corporations, these are companies in two or more countries. They dominate global world trade and they are responsible for developing a global supply chain. So you need to know a bit about generally TNCs. So for example, spatial organization, production, leakages and trading and marketing patterns. And then you also need to know your own case study, um, which you can add in facts linking to them. So the spatial organizations of TNCs. Now this obviously depends which specific TNC you're talking about, but mostly research and developments, R&D or headquarters are located in HICs. So for example, Silicon Valley is an area where there's a lot of innovation that occurs. And so a lot of kind of headquarters might be located there. You also have a lot of headquarters in London, for example. Um, and manufacturing where labor is cheaper is usually in kind of LICs, NEEs, there might be special economic zones or there might be less environmental regulations um, in Asia and therefore they might offshore their factories, talked about before, to um, countries where they can earn more profit. However, some TNCs also have factories where the market is. So for example, Nissan, um, a car company, um, and this means that they don't have to pay taxes to trade in an area. So we talked about those kind of trade blocks. So if they're already within an area where there's a lot of market, they have less taxes to pay. Production, outsourcing and offshoring, they might use this to increase their profits. So for example, they might offshore their factories where there's cheaper labor, and this can, this 
creates that global supply chain. Linkages, when we talk about linkages, we're talking about how TNCs make links to expand their operations. Um, this goes into the book, it's quite detailed in some of your textbooks. I don't actually think you've had to really answer questions about this in detail in the exam, but you might get asked the role of TNCs in the global economy, so it's quite good to know. So mergers, acquisitions, FDI. Um, mergers is when two companies of a similar size join together. So for example, Exxon and Mobile in 1998, so they're now Exxon Mobile, um, both oil companies. Acquisitions is when a company buys another country, so for example, Facebook and Instagram in 2012. FDI is investing money into a company or country, and this can also include mergers or acquisitions. Um, and then you also have kind of vertical integration and horizontal integration. So vertical integration is when a company takes over the supply chain. So for example, Shell and many oil countries, they are from very much from the extraction to the selling. So you'll see Shell garages, but you'll also see Shell oil rigs. And then horizontal integration is when there's similar size of production, they kind of similar stage or similar size, they join. Um, so, yeah, so if you're having a look at kind of global markets or global supply chains, maybe that some of those key terms are quite useful for you to know. This basically all gives TNCs greater control of markets. And then I'm briefly going to talk about some of the positives and negatives of TNCs, as I think this is good for us to go through. And then you can add this own information for your own case study. Okay, so if we're looking at advantages and disadvantages, we want to think about TNCs, the host country. So basically where the TNC is kind of going into, it might be where their production is, and also the TNC origin, so where they're originally, they were ornate, uh, originated from, for example, the headquarters. And then like many impacts, we can talk about social, economic, and environmental. You can also, when you're thinking about impacts, exam tip, think about local and global, and also short-term and long-term, but we're just looking at social, economic, and environmental. You can also think about political, but we're just keeping with these at the moment. Um, so positives for the TNC host country. First of all, social, um, there might be jobs and these can increase the amount of skills and the population. So for example, if a company has a factory over there, they are supplying skilled jobs. However, there might be poor working conditions. Economy um, can increase the multiplier effect and also increase the amount of FDI in a country. However, there can, can be economic leakages where the money goes back to the country. Or we talked about this earlier, repatriation of profits. So many companies will take back the profits to the country of origin and then environmental ones quite hard to think about um, there could be an increase in sustainable technology or just technological like sharing um, however like this is a big one so you might want to highlight this environmental pollution so air land and water there's normally a lot of environmental pollution in kind of host countries if you're thinking about manufacturing particularly if there are kind of less environmental regulations which is one factor encouraging a com company to offshore or outsource their products over there in the origin um social positives there will be lots of good customers and obviously and um sorry and there might be high skilled jobs in like kind of innovation however um uh, there might have been de-industrialization that might have occurred because previously the factories might have been in um in that country and then moved um for the economy hopefully there's been low prices um however um negatives is that the tncs can dominate businesses and so if you're linking to changing places tncs can contribute to the kind of clone town effect where every high street looks the same and then also um, looking at positives, there could be an increase in renewable technology um, and that kind of innovation. But the environment mainly, I would say, the negative is the TNC host country environmental pollution. Okay, so Apple is the case study that um, I teach at school. So you might have a different case study. And if so, just follow what I just talked about before, um, for example, spatial distribution, etc., and um, do that for your own case study. So Apple, the headquarters and R&D Center is in the Apple campus in California. It's very cool if you see a photo of it. Um, the EU headquarters are in Cork, Ireland, and the online support is there. So if you actually call up if you have an Apple product, um, you normally get an Irish accent, which is quite cool. Uh, I think that's to do with tax purposes. Um, the factories, most, most production is outsourced to Foxconn, which is a Chinese company, and many of the factories are in mainland China. 
So if we have a look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of Apple, um, the factories and um, can upskill workers and the employment, apparently Apple has 4.8 million jobs in China. Um, many of this is through Foxconn because they outsource their production um, and Foxconn is China's largest private employer of 1.3 million people. However, there are also massive disadvantages. We're mainly talking about the host country here, particularly China. So there are really poor working conditions, so really long working days. So for example, Apple workers are have reported to be working for 60 hour weeks and get paid like $150 per month. And in 2010, not 2014, there were 14 suicides. If you have a look at the factories, they're crazy. Like there can't be like a speck of dust anywhere because of the Apple products. And they're just like on their feet the whole time. There's quite a few videos if you want to check it out too. Just some like other facts I'll just put down here. Founded in 1976, employs 18,000 people directly, but obviously lots of people are employed indirectly through outsourcing. Um, and in 2014, they saw sold 74.5 million iPhones and they have loads of profits. They're one of the biggest TNCs like in the world. Um, you should know case study facts. If you are studying Apple, no more facts than I've written down here. So go away and just like add some more facts, but here are some to kind of start you off. So that is the international trade and access to market part. And um, please do you have a break. As I said, this is a mega marathon long video of everything. Um, Hopefully that's useful. Yeah, just make sure that kind of particularly for apple and bananas that you put your own case study in there as well. Okay, so next I'm going to be going on to some of the inequalities, looking at the positives and negatives of globalization. And then we'll be looking at global commons and Antarctica. So in this next section, welcome back everyone, we are going to be talking about global governance, global systems, so global governance is 32.14, global systems 32.12, and also globalization critique 32.16. This is because if you look at the specification, they all talk about kind of the positives and negatives of globalization and global systems and kind of inequalities, injustices, conflict, and therefore we should all group them together. Otherwise, A, you're just going to be repeating it. And also now you have a bit more full like, kind of mind map of kind of what's going on. You can draw on what you've learned from the other mind maps to make this one really good and really think about in the back of your head, like, do you think there are more positives from globalizations or negatives from globalization? So kind of have that in the back of your mind. You might want to even draw a summary table to put together all of your ideas. Global governance. This is the idea that nations and organizations can work together to deal with threats and challenges the world faces. We do not have a government for the world. We have lots of different governments in different countries. Um, however, governments should work together um, and there's different norms and laws. So norms are the accepted standard of behavior and laws are legally binded by countries. So for example, there are laws on human rights and how people should be treated. However, we know that this is not always the case with different countries and so this can actually cause lots of political kind of conflict and disagreements. Um, so if we have a look at global governance, we talked briefly before about the UN. So just to recap, set up after 1945, to um, after World War II to promote peace, growth and stability, 193 countries. Um, and so one way this global governance as the UN is promoting peace, um, which we want and stability, which we want to have a look in kind of the specification, is that they have the UN peacekeepers. So these protect civilians, reduce violence, strengthen communities through kind of the blue helmets. And um, they, for example, were successful in the Ivory Coast after there was lots of civil unrest. Um, however, um, they've not always been um, successful and I'll come back to that. Um, the UN has also kind of released the Sustainable Development Goals. These were in 2015, 17 goals for all countries to tackle inequalities and encourage sustainable development. The Sustainable Development Goals include the environment and many other kind of factors. Um, they're different, very different to the eight Millennium Development Goals, which were released in the millennium, and so from 2000 to 2015, and these were predominantly aimed at kind of poverty and LICs. The Sustainable Development Goals are actually talking about the whole globe and how they can increase sustainably 
in, and encourage development sustainably. However, as we know with the UN, there is also the power of veto. So some countries have more power in decision making and through the Security Council. And the UN has also be cri- been criticised for failure to act. For example, in the Rwandan genocide in 1994, there were 800,000 people dead. And um, many people blame the UN saying they could have had an impact and they could have reduced the genocide that was occurring there. There are, if you have a look online for UN kind of positives and negatives and even the peacekeeping forces as well, there's some quite good examples because what you really want to think about is are the, do the UN manage to promote growth and peace? So, for example, through the Sustainable Development Goals and what's been the positives. So, for example, um, through the Millennium Development Goals, a lot more, there was a lot more gender, inequ- gender equality, a lot more girls went to school. You can also find some facts on that. However, they're not all perfect. And there's been a lot of critique also in the UN, as we talked about. Are they just biased towards some con- the countries who kind of are on the... UN Security Council and the winners of World War II. So now we're going to talk about global systems, the part of the specification that talked about issues with interdependence. So remember, and this links to the specification, so I'll write it here, unequal flows, goods, labour, capital, etc. can promote um, stability and growth. Um, We know that, for example, if we talk about migrants again, they send remittances back and Nepal has 25% of its GDP. Um, from remittances um, that can produce development however they can cause inequalities injustices and conflict so I'm going to draw a lovely table here I'm going to use a ruler so it's nice and neat for the first time whilst I'm making these mind maps Um, so it's actually quite useful to split up people money ideas and technology when we're thinking about the different flows we'll talk briefly about the benefits and then think about the inequalities injustices and conflict Now, if we think about inequalities, remember that is how unequal they are, and that can be like within and between countries. And injustices is more like how fair or unfair something is. And conflict is obviously like arguments um, which can occur between different players. So if we start with labour, which I've, I've just mentioned, so for example, movement of people from around the globe, for example, migration, Nepal to the Gulf, this can be positives, it can lead to development, um, however, and it can also reduce, for example, Nepal's dependency on aid. However, this can lead to inequality. So particularly it is many of the young men the, who are skilled workers who are leaving um, and they normally benefit the most. Um, and however, this can form an employment gap. Um, and it's, they, they usually benefit the most um, from employment opportunities. However, this can inc- this can cause internal inequalities, particularly within rural areas, and a lot of women are being left behind. It can also lead to brain drain. Some of you might have heard this before, where more of the educated people are leaving to get jobs in one area and leaving the po- many of the population behind. So inequalities can be caused within a country. When we're thinking about injustices, there's many unfair working conditions. There's loads on this on the news about this, particularly exploitation in the Middle East from um, Nepalese workers. Um, This exploitation has led to deaths and particularly the FIFA World Cup came under scrutiny when in Qatar 1,400 people died in making kind of the World Cup stadiums. This can also lead to conflict. and kind of workers in conflict with their employees, but also conflict to do with immigration laws as well, and kind of that movement of people between different countries. So if we talk about money, particularly kind of TNCs and profits, however, we can talk about different aspects of money or FDI. Um, There obviously can be lots of benefits. So for example, there might be more stability from increased trade. Trade encourages cooperation and international agreements. So the world, there might not be as many conflicts. Um, Economic growth can lead to the multiplier effect. And also, if you have investment in one area, um, this can also lead to increase in kind of social aspects as well. So HDI might develop as services are invested into, not just kind of those factories. However, again, there can be massive inequality. Um, So the access to markets is uneven. This increases internal inequality. We talked about the Gini coefficient, how some, um, particularly with TNCs, some people will be earning a lot of money and workers might be exploited. So there can be an increase in the Gini coefficient or inequality within a country. 
injustices can be caused because of low wages in developing countries. Um, so we've seen this with Apple and injustices with, um, in 2010, 14 people committed suicide. Um, there can also be with different kind of, um, not some, it might not be TNCs, but kind of unequal flows of money around the world it can be kind of modern, um, modern slavery might occur, child labour might occur. And then also um, local businesses might no longer be able to operate as TNCs take over. Disputes can also arrive, arise after tariffs are put on um, between countries. And then also conflict can also occur when there's been deforestation for raw, raw materials. And this can lead to environmental conflict. So for example, palm oil, um, had the, um, to farm palm oil in Malaysia and Indonesia, there's been a lot of trees that have been cut down, deforestation. Some of this has been illegal and this has led to a lot of environmental conflict in those areas. And then if we think about technology, we know the access to technology across the world is uneven. Internet is available globally, um, positives, and it can support education. So if um, you can be anywhere around the world and learn, um, and this can support development, and also transport and communication can spread ideas to people. Um, and this actually, lots of spreading our ideas kind of encourages migration, etc. However, it is uneven. Some countries, as we talked about, might be switched off from globalisation. So the country itself might not have good kind of access to wireless technology or people might not be able to afford the internet themselves. Injustices with the internet and services, there can also be censorship on people. So for example, China, this can limit social globalisation. So for example, you can't have Facebook over there. So there's injustices and also a lot of the internet use is regulated. And then also there is conflict. So many ideas are dominated by Western views, for example, views on trade, and also privatisation can lead to conflict as we talked about. So these are many kind of Western views and that can cause a lot of conflict. And so what it also comes down to is through interdependence, globalisation creates dependency, which leads to issues of inequality, injustices and conflict. So this is kind of starting to weigh up those scales on positives and negatives. One final thing I just want to add about money um, when we're considering aid is that aid can find its way into armed groups. This can also lead to conflict um, as well. So um, there's a really good BBC documentary on um, how aid from the UK was put into the hands of the jihadis and how that occurred. So that is also the kind of unequal flows causing conflict around the world. So what we're really thinking about is it that globalisation is making some countries more powerful Countries that access, um, countries with access to market, TNCs can control markets and influence the global economy. If we consider climate change, HICs, many of them have contributed to most of the emissions um, and countries are, that are impacted from climate change might be low income countries or for example like Bangladesh who should reduce emissions. Um, there's lots of like debates over this like whose responsibility is it? Do global institutions such as the UN, the power veto, the Security Council reinforce unequal power relations? Um, the UN, IMF, World Bank, most headquarters are in HICs and these influence decision making. So it's for you really to think about what do you think um, about how equal or unequal power relationships are. And then if we just go a bit back to kind of climate change, the Paris Climate Change Agreement in 2016, the goal was to keep emissions below two degrees. The US pulled out, again, like unequal power relationships. They have so much influence around the world. Like, is it fair? Whose responsibility is it? Should all countries have to reduce emissions, such as India, when they're going through their kind of industrial revolution? Um, many debates to have. Very interesting. And then another note to note about governance is that it occurs at all scales so global international national regional and local and these work together so it's not just one player that is making um, a decision and then you also have NGOs so for example global you have the UN international is like for example the EU national you might have the UK government local local authorities um, these will all implement the decisions made so if you're looking say at climate change um, the UN and the International Paris P, uh, International Panel of Climate Change will make decisions and the EU will have rules, the UK and the local authorities will also adapt it in their own way as well. 
And then you also have NGOs that operate at a range of scales. They might be local NGOs, they might be global NGOs that work in a local area. I haven't gone in too much detail to here. So if you wanted to add a quick case study, you could talk about the role, say, for example, of Oxfam in um, promoting stability and peace. Um, for example, they work around the world um, in so many locations to try and improve like children's education and female rights. Water Aid is another one as well. Plan International is one of my favourite um, NGOs, which works to increase gender equality around the world, and they do a range of fantastic things. So um, you can kind of look at the governance also comparing them to NGOs. Globalisation Critique 3. 0.2.16 which is the final point of this specification um we haven't gone over antarctica yet so that will be the next mind map but as i said this massively links to thinking about the previous two parts of the specification so the key argument are uh, is what are the benefits of globalization what are the costs of globalization the benefits according to the spec and there are different benefits as well but good words for you to know growth, development, integration, and stability on one side. The costs, inequalities, injustices, conflict, and environmental impacts. So you need to weigh up in your mind, do you think there are more benefits to globalization or costs to globalization? And a good 20 marker would be there are more benefits or costs to global than cost to globalization. To what extent do you agree? So you really want to have that in mind. It's quite good for you to summarize all your notes on it. When you are talking about the impacts of globalization, kind of the impacts with anything to do with geography, you should think about social, economic, environmental, and political. See, um, so you always do that when you're um, looking at an essay for A level geography. You can also think about local and global impacts and also short term and long term. So there's many different ways you should be evaluating what you think are the impacts and therefore this will help you coming to an informed decision which you should always write in a conclusion. So I'm going to give you three examples of kind of negative parts of globalization which you can use in your evaluation as well. So they are e-waste, ship breaking, and also new shipping routes. There's also Rana Plaza, which I've forgotten to write down, but I will also make sure that is written down. Um, I explain it to you as well. E-waste, this is so interesting. I've actually made a video on it, which you should watch. Um, this is massively like an impact from globalization because it wouldn't, have occur wouldn't occur if there wasn't globalization. So e-waste is electronic waste, which is deposited in kind of different countries. So globalization increases the flow of e-waste. So for example, like we wouldn't have as many products around the world um, if there wasn't globalization. So for example, computers, iPhones, etc. But then also the, like, the ra rate of rapid um, like commercialization means we have so much and we have such a consumer society and we throw away so much as well. And what happens is um, a lot of these goods kind of go to developing countries, say for example, Ghana, and um, they are broken down by... Um, young men um, or a range of different people and they try and get the metal out from them for example copper from copper wires and they sell that in an economy um, on like the slums there are so many environmental and um, social issues from this so first of all there's land pollution and water pollution as toxic materials seep into the ground air pollution as the burning of e-waste gets um, gets released and and this copper like releases to toxic chemicals. This actually occurs in a place called Agloboshi, which is in um, Ghana in a, um, a slum. And Reggie Yates does a documentary where he goes to visit it. So as I said, I made a video, so definitely check that one out. Um, social, the toxic materials, lead found in old electronic goods. This can damage human blood, kidneys, cause lung cancer. Many men die in their 20s. There's no or little protection for workers and the the workers at like the kind of the bottom of the food chain, um, which where they're actually burning the copper um, to get the copper out of the wires are called burner boys. And you just see these pictures of like black smoke going straight into their lungs. And like, is that fair that like this is massive? Like if you think about injustices and also like inequality, like is that fair that our waste, I'm saying our waste, but... I'm not sure where everybody is listening to this from around the world, is um, 
taken to these countries often illegally and disposed of we don't think about our waste like we put in our bin and like don't think about it and they can cause so much environmental and social pollution so sorry, i'm going on a bit of a rant here but i definitely think it is something you should um look up and i definitely think it is a massive injustice and caused through globalization the trading routes shipping routes and also kind of our like yeah as i said our consumption ship breaking is another thing which again gets me quite like angry about so basically ship breaking and i made a video on this so these are things i find really interesting so this is why i'm kind of make some um geography videos on them on youtube so this is basically breaking down the container ships most metal is recycled or sold um ship breaking occurs mostly in india pakistan and bangladesh so what happens is these old container ships um they, obviously everything has a lifespan they are pushed onto shore and men kind of break down so they can get like the metal out and they can recycle them. And it's these like beautiful beaches that if you look on Google Earth, which I show on the video, it's you just see ship after ship after ship and it like causes so much damage and pollution, like inequality that has occurred in Bangladesh because um, people want like workers can get money. Um, the government like wants to like have the recycling industry as well. Inequality doesn't happen on English shores. There's like rules and regulations and injustices like that's just really unfair. Men work without protection as well. So environmental pollution to beaches, hazardous materials seeps into the soil, land and water and the sea um, obviously it will damage ecosystems and workers have no or little protection. Fires actually start on the ships and sometimes there's kind of these explosions, deaths occur and also there are really low wages. So massive injustices huge um i'm briefly going to talk about rana plaza so rana plaza um you might have heard was a factory that kind of um collapsed in bangladesh um so it was a factory that had some of the clothes were being made for kind of h&m and i think it was 1400 people died um but check that up it's like you'll see it if you have a look on youtube um but basically they um women and many people working in the factory really cramped conditions they told the um they told the kind of people in charge that there was going to be that the walls were all cracking and it was looked like it was going to fall in and because they're so competitive on making the cheapest clothing for kind of primark h&m that they basically don't look after the workers they don't look after the factories and it collapsed and caused yeah like over a thousand deaths i think it was in 2015 and again in inequality like factories are over there because it's cheap labor injustices because it's just really unfair on the workers and obviously devastating like families have been destroyed like is that a fair consequence of globalization this is all questions for you to think about and then finally if we talk about some new shipping routes so there are new shipping routes um north of russia due to increased ice melt from global warming so as the arctic is melting um you can basically like trade with containers and they have these kind of nuclear icebreakers and russia has loads of them they like smash through the ice basically um and this reduces travel time from china because they can basically go through the north trade route instead of south through like the suez canal which is the longer route and um this can increase more shipping rate um lanes for china changing the pattern of trade as well and increasing the amount of trade however further contribution to global warming as containers release carbon dioxide and obviously this might lead to more climate change and global warming therefore melting the ice further causing more environmental damage so thinking about kind of environmental damage and like is that fair like that um is another consequence of globalization so this is basically where you come in and where i will never kind of give you the answer what is your opinion like what are the positives of globalization what are the negatives of globalization like we live in such a globalized world there are so many positives and i definitely cannot argue with the positives however there are loads of negatives there are loads of inequalities like gini inequality we looked at is increasing in some countries um or if not many countries with the growth of tncs there are many negatives such as the injustices as we talked about with rana plaza the um the ship breaking and e-waste some countries um have unequal power relations like the un has so much influence from some five key members like is that fair like they rep um won world war ii which is kind of 70 years ago like that's a bit ridiculous um but there are loads of positives and um like inequality 
and like um, gender equality has massively improved across the world um, and you could argue that not as many people are oppressed um, there's yeah I, it's basically your opinion so um, I would complete this opinion line um, where do you think positives and negatives and write a line to kind of justify why in your head um, just yeah there are lots of positives and there are lots of negatives um, would we have a big positive would we be stuck in kind of colonial times where those kind of HICs and LICs and HICs are kind of just dominating and um, causing massive global inequality, whereas through globalisation, many countries such as China, China is now the second largest economy in the world. So, yeah, what's your opinion? Have a go. That is this mind map, um, looking at all those topics joined together. Hopefully you'll see why I put them all together because they all link. And then have a break. And the final part final my map is on antarctica which i do not think is going to be as long as this so nearly there Okay, so next we are on to the final part of the specification. Super exciting. So um, it is the Global Commons, which is 3.2.15, but with a particular focus on also Antarctica as a global common, looking at threats and governance and understanding the geography about it. So we're going to first start with kind of what is a global common, um, just a small part um, of the specification, and then we'll go more detail into Antarctica. So a global common is an area which is not owned by a single country or an organisation. So basically they belong to everyone. And there's four main ones. So you have Antarctica, the high seas. Um, normally countries can control the first kind of 20, 200 metres of their coastline. And then it becomes the high seas, um, which is therefore um, not owned by anyone. The atmosphere and outer space. So these are all usually governed by different international laws. And they kind of are the Earth's shared resources. Um, one thing to note, and particularly when we're thinking about governance, and this massively links to Antarctica, the reason why we need kind of these shared laws so that countries just can't claim them for themselves is because it avoids what's called the tragedy of the commons. So basically the tragedy of the commons occurs if lots of people say rush that area and then they try to use the resources there. And this might lead to over-exploitation. Um, and this can occur without... A kind of unified government saying actually this is the earth's resources we really need to protect it okay so antarctica looking at the geography antarctica is the coldest driest windiest i think place on earth um and the most unhospitable unhabitable place on earth like there's actually no populations that have lived there um fully and kind of like embedded their lives down there it is because 98 percent of antarctica is covered by ice it's actually 10 percent of the world's land's like surface which is huge and um, it has the highest elevation like average elevation of all continents with two i think it's average 2000 meters and the highest mountain is there mount um vison massif at fourth thousand eight hundred and ninety two meters um, it is surrounded by the southern ocean and actually the specification when you're thinking about it you're not just thinking about the geography in terms of the land um, mass and the ice you are thinking about the southern ocean as well so when we look at ecosystems it's really important that you're thinking about that southern ocean which kind of goes to the peninsula in um, south america um, a bit around make sure you have a map so you can kind of see it it is the coldest continent so temperatures reach um minus 60 put 60 in winter there are six months of darkness um, which you have at both poles um, because sometimes the um, earth is just completely covered in shade the other side of the sun and it is technically a cold desert so there's only 16 centimeters of rain per year um just a little exam tip you there have been exams where you have to interpret climate graphs and statistics linked to antarctica so maybe just make sure that you've kind of are familiar with looking at climate graphs and kind of elevation wind um just a bit about the physical geography there are also lots of websites online um 
understanding Antarctica for kind of schools and there's lots of quizzes so have a look online there's some really good resources to test yourself on. Now the Antarctic conversion zone this does is mentioned in the um, spec for you to kind of um, and some people like to have a, a bit more understanding about it um, if you are study biology you might know even more about it but this is a real simple explanation, but it's quite important when you're thinking about the ecosystems and the productivity of the oceans. So what you have is there is different types um, of water um, temperatures. Obviously, where there's the ice in Antarctica, immediately it's very, very cold. So what happens is the warm subarctic ocean um, waters which is just like beyond the Southern Ocean, meet the cold water of the Southern Ocean. So remember, it's colder towards the towards Antarctica. And what happens is when you have different waters of different temperatures, um, it kind of also, it also depends on like salinity, so how much salt there is. Um, but basically, cold water will kind of dent, um, is dent, quite dense and will go to the bottom of the ocean's floor, um, whereas warm water will rise, kind of like warm and cold air. And basically the meeting of water creates a very productive ecosystem. So with the upwelling of currents, the upwellings, the cold water upwells, brings nutrients. Um, and so krill, plankton and seabirds flock along the convergence. So there's this little band called the convergence um, zone, which is this really productive part of the ecosystem. These are important for the food chain and disruption to this so, so we're going to look at kind of through climate change or overfishing um, can massively impact the ecosystems so yeah as I said just have a bit of an idea about the importance of the Antarctic conversion zone so that when you're looking at the impacts you can explain why it's so bad if it gets disrupted okay so as we said at the beginning Antarctica is a global common and this basically means it isn't owned or governed by everyone and it's got quite an interesting history of how it um, came how the kind of governance of it came about and we are going to talk about kind of governments and managing the threats but just like a quick overview um, when we're thinking about territorial land um, previously in the past um, kind of like um, colonialism is that countries that if there wasn't like a, a native population there which there hasn't been in Antarctica it was normally the first people to basically claim the land and in I mean like Britain was one of the first people there and, and countries basically started to like claim different areas of the land and if you have a look online you can see a map of like territorial um, land it's basically where the UK went and then lots of other countries rushed in so like Germany Argentina, Norway, Chile, Australia, and they basically started to be like, this is our land. Um, and then in after World War II, actually Germany like lost their land. And then in 1959, 12 countries signed the Antarctic Treaty System, which we will talk about um, in a second, basically saying that they all have mutual sovereignty over the land. So they all kind of own it. And it's quite interesting because although their territorial land still stands, um, those claims they made originally, they it's actually like they they are all said that they would govern it together. And basically the land was said that it was going to be a peaceful land where there to be no military activity and a place for scientific research. So um we will talk about kind of yeah the treaty as a way of governing it in a second but just so you know like in short Antarctica is kind of owned by no one but also kind of shared by everyone at the same time. Okay so looking at the threats to Antarctica we mainly have climate change, fishing and whaling, um, tourism and scientific research and there is also search for mineral um, resources which I will write on in a second. Um, it's really important that you know these and know some facts to go with them because if you know some facts and you know a bit of evidence just learn like one fact per statement or two then when you're writing in your essay it shows the examiners you know it but also it means that you've kind of pre-learned that and it means that you can then spend your energy like evaluating it and thinking which is worse so as we're going through these have in the back of your mind like what is happening and then which one is most threatening to Antarctica so we have a look at climate change first. 
Antarctica is heavily impacted from global warming and it actually warms at a rate five times higher than the average rate around the world. So over the last 30 years, temperatures have increased by three degrees. So that is like massive. So it's had one of the biggest increase in temperatures. Um, the Antarctic Peninsula is one of the fastest warming locations in the world and the ice melting can basically lead to plants growing. So if you remember that 98% of it is ice, if the ice melts and then you have um, land surface, then plants might grow and this can basically change the ecosystem because you're not used to having these plants there. Climate change and warming of oceans can also um, increase ocean acidification. So the CO2 in the air can um, is absorbed into the ocean and that can impact plankton and um, it can like disrupt the ecosystems. Okay, so next if we go on to fishing and whaling, um, basically fishing and whaling, if you overfish or, um, kill, or kill too many whales to eat, this will lead to species being extinct. And we've kind of seen that in different areas of Antarctica. So in 1930s, um, the, from fishing, so you, there's actually some like crazy photos where pe you see these disused fishing ships um, where people used to set up kind of um, areas where they could live and they would fish um, or they would hunt um, sea um, seals. So the, in 1930s, Antarctic fur seal was almost wiped out. Um, the blue whale population is currently um, between 10 to 25,000, which is 3 to 11 percent. They're not quite sure, obviously, it's really hard to measure of the 1911 figure. So basically, 100 years ago, there was so many more blue whale, and today we only have 3 percent average or 5 6 percent of that figure. So it's massively dropped. So it's a tenth of the size. So you can change these figures to how you remember them best. Um, since krill po population has dropped by 80% since 1970s, um, again, good fact to know because the krill is at the kind of the bottom of the food chain. Minke whales um, are kind of really under threat today. So um, technically we'll look at this, there is a, um, a ban on whaling. But in 2018, Japan killed 303 minke whales of which 122 were pregnant females. And this has occurred even with restrictions on whaling. And they say that they whale for scientific research. And so people are very like skeptical of that. Um, if you're having a look at the kind of impacts from it, whaling and fishing is potentially going to be a massive long-term threat because if you ex if a, you lead a species to extinction, then they're never, they might not ever come back. Or if you impact the food chain, it can change everything for like, years and years to come so you could say that's maybe like potentially a long-term threat um this has obviously been going on for a couple hundred years um to like 200 years and if you have a look went back to climate change you might say it's more of a modern um threat you might argue it's different it has actually been going on but maybe people haven't realized um the threat until kind of recent times as well so you can see how i'm starting to evaluate it Okay, so tourism. There's been a steady increase mainly since 2011. However, tourism has been was occurring before then as well. Um, so some facts. Um, 1990s, 5,000 visitors um, per year. And in 2016, 44,000 visitors per year. So you can see a massive increase. And if you wanted to work out the percentage increase, that might be a good thing to do. Um, Antarctica is sometimes seen as an area of last chance tourism. This basically means that people are thinking in their heads be like oh i can either see antarctica now and all the kind of like penguins and the animals there whales um before we're not allowed to go there anymore so there's kind of you might see there's potentially like a, a rush of people going there because they think that actually in kind of five ten years time there might be a, a limit on the amount of tourists that are allowed to go there and there are also, also already like some rules and regulations with tourism and we'll come on to that the main issues with tourism would be the pollution, um, waste. Normally tourists actually have to take their waste home. There's some like rules for tourism, which are either in the textbooks as well that you can read about. Um, the main thing is that um, trampling on vegetation can damage it or you can disturb animals. And also, um, particularly like in the treads of people's foot, um, shoes, so basically the sole parts of it, um, you can bring in a kind of seeds or something like that from a, a different area and you can introduce non-native species. Um, so this is 
like a really this can massively change an ecosystem so if you have the plant seeds or like a something from a different area that starts growing on antarctica they are normally sometimes also invasive species so this means they can um they might change the ecosystems and um, disrupt like the whole food webs so that's something important to consider um scientific research now this comes under the threats and i suppose also the scientists do need their facilities um if you look on human planet david attenborough there's some like amazing videos where you see the new amderson scott south pole station and you actually um it's at the um it's basically looking at like human um the human planet and you see a little bit about kind of expeditions to the and to antarctica and kind of how like technology has changed so that's quite good to check out um and basically once you're there um, as a scientist you will stay there for months at a time whether it's a threat because they're doing so much protection is a question as well um they are there normally to study many different factors so wildlife weather geology atmosphere the david attenborough one shows them going into these caves under these volcanoes which are amazing um, and they measure the, they can um, look at the atmosphere as well because Antarctica has the least polluted skies in the whole world. And they can also look at changes in climate change. So there's a lot of kind of scientific research. It looks amazing, the kind of work they do. And then for mining, there are large deposits of minerals. So there's coal, iron ore. Um, and in the Southern Ocean, um, which we are also looking at, that's important, there is lots of oil. So currently there is a ban. So the Madrid Protocol 1991, um, is an extension of the Antarctic Treaty System. So we'll go on to all of these in a second. And um, they basically said that you can't ma um, mine minerals. Um, however, some countries, including Japan and the UK and USA, have argued it to be revisited before. Um, revisited in 2048 to change like, the rules and regulations, and China and Russia want it to be revisited before. So is this a potentially a future threat? Um, it's maybe not a threat now, but if the rules change in 2048, will it be more of a threat? So thinking about how these threats impact each other. Okay, so governance. There's a few ways of looking at this and working it out, but the key thing to know is that governance obviously links to the threats. So you need to be evaluating what are the how is it being governed or how are these threats being managed how, are they successful or are they not so you can either do it as a table actually i haven't done it in a table and end up drawing lines across which can make it look a little bit messier apologies um so you can either look at the threats and then put like a column across and be like how are they managed and then are they effective and that's probably quite a good way. So um, when I talk about these, you might want to do that or you can just look at them. And because some of these management ones do obviously cover a through a few of the different threats. So first of all, you have international organisations. And we've talked about kind of international organisations before. Um, and you have some of the UN agencies. So you have the UNEP, which is the United Nations Environment Programme. And then you also have the IWC, which is the International Whaling Commission. Now, sometimes some textbooks do say the IDWC is an NGO. It is actually an IGO, but um, I think because some textbooks have got it confused, if you write it as the wrong one in the exam, it should normally be fine, but it is an IGO. So if we start first with the UNEP, the UNEP reports on Antarctic activity to the UN, and they also have something called um, the Commission for the Conservation of Antarctic marine living resources ccamlr so basically they are aiming to protecting areas and stop illegal fishing you then also have the iwc um, and this is basically responsible for regulating whaling so they declared a and this the iwc um, was in 1946 um, because obviously the issues with kind of overfishing and whaling. So they declared a pause on commercial whaling. So basically commercial whaling is just like um, whaling to then kind of sell um, for food consumption. Um, and this was called the well moratorium. So that basically just means ban. And that was in 1982. Um, and then also in 1994, they set up a whale sanctuary in the Southern Ocean. So I think this is where like kind of whales can be protected. Um, you've also got to then evaluate that, like, is that being successful? So if we link it to the threats, 
it, this kind of the IWC massively obviously helps to manage whaling and overfishing. However, um, and whereas it doesn't so much link to saying mining or tourism. However, as we know, Japan has been hunting whales under scientific research. So what are the loopholes? Is it successful? Is it not successful? Etc. And then you have certain international laws which are also governing Antarctica. So I'm just using the ones that are on the specification. You won't need to know all of them in detail. So in 1959, you have the Antarctic Treaty, the ATS, which we talked about previously. So this basically says how Antarctica should be managed um, and the fact that it's not governed by a single country and that all states share the sovereignty. Um, So it's rules on how Antarctica should be sustainably managed. They say that there should be no kind of um, military use there, military training. And it says that Antarctica should be used for peaceful reasons. So they ban military activity. It's a free zone of nuclear testing. Countries should cooperate on scientific research and it Antarctica should remain as a global common and this reduces the threat of tragedy of the commons which we talked about before which is over-exploitation. over-exploitation. Um, the protocol of on environment protection of the Antarctic Treaty focuses, um, 1991 focuses to protect the environment and it also bans mining so this is also called the Madrid Protocol because it was signed in Madrid so that law clearly links to the threat of mining um, and mineral extraction and then as we mentioned before another rule um, law was 1982 the IWC whale moratorium which is the banning of commercial whaling so we've got these laws so you can say like are they successful are they not successful one thing which is also not mentioned in the specification is governance or managing climate change as a threat. So I'm just going to add this in here. So Paris Climate Change Agreement 2016, this aims to reduce global warming. We talked about that before to um, to not above two degrees. However, like the US has dropped out. And you'll also see that the international organisations don't specifically address tourism. But in 1994, there were further guidelines given. So the tourist operators in Antarctica organised the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators in 1991, which is the IAATO, and they basically give rules and regulations on what tourists should do to protect the environment. So the main thing is, is that nothing brought to Antarctica should stay on Antarctica. So that means waste, even like human waste. Um, anything that should can be removed should be removed. And they also have like numbers on limits of how many people can get off a um, a ship at a time so or a tour operator at a time so you can have that look up there I think the rules are online then on the other side you also have NGOs so these are non-governmental organizations so remember when we think about governance we had think of there's lots of different scales and there's different players so these are um, for example there's many different ones but Greenpeace and ASOC um, is a is a is a group of NGOs so Greenpeace you all have seen they can be quite um, like not violent but quite active um, in what the, the message they're trying to portray. So Greenpeace has a body of representatives of whale experts at the IWC meetings so you can see how kind of NGOs and IGOs are kind of working together and they campaign to ban commercial whaling but they do have very strong actions so you'll kind of see that they go up to there's like pictures if you search into Google um, Greenpeace, Japan, whaling, and they will literally go and try and like physically make a barrier and stop the um, the boats from whaling. Um, and then ASOC is a group of 30 NGOs from around the world. So you include Greenpeace and WWF, um, and they present findings at um, on the environment and the kind of safety problems of tourism, and they give recommendations on tourism um, to protect the environment. So they establish marine reserves, reduce the threats of fishing and whaling. So this one kind of really talks about kind of tourism, fishing and whaling, kind of just any kind of environmental impacts and tries to give advice. Now, it's really important to think that the um, NGOs are like much smaller scale. Um, They might not have as much funding and they can't, create the laws however they can influence laws as we've seen they have representatives um ngos are really good at spreading awareness so they might have campaigns that we see on like social media and sometimes they're very good at activating the public to be able to do something whereas you have 
when we're looking at IGOs and international laws, these are kind of rules and regulations for global commons and that countries should abide to. However, some don't. Also, when we're evaluating them, thinking about IGOs, do some countries have more influence than others? So not everyone um, is a member of the ACS or do certain countries yeah, have more decision making? Also, laws do not, they take a long time to put into action. They are very slow and there's less immediacy. So if you're thinking about a threat, maybe spreading people's awareness on kind of climate change or um, whaling, are NGOs more successful at reaching maybe the public um, to spread awareness, whereas laws can take a very long time to go through? So these are all different things that you should be evaluating. Another thing that I think is quite important to evaluate is um, the future, and this can help you in your decision making. So I'm not going to give you the answer on which threat is um, has the greatest threat in Antarctica or which international organisation is most successful. Like That is for you to do. Um, but if we're thinking about the future, Will the Madrid Protocol be extended or will mining become a new threat in 2048? Climate change, will it speed up? Also, we've looked at the international, the IPCC. That's That requires not just, that's a very global impact and also requires a lot of governance at a global scale with lots of different players and countries all playing their part. Whereas, say, whaling, is just having a ban and then for example say japan you can you can sanction different countries so which threat is easier to manage is climate change too difficult to manage and that can impact like the ecosystems um whereas fishing and whaling is easier to manage because you just need rules and regulations or maybe tourism is the easiest one to manage um we still have japan um who is fishing and whaling like what will happen in the future there will other countries want to also um um, and will, will other countries also want to um, continue fishing and whaling? Will that impact ecosystems for the whole like future? And then also tourism, is it increasing still or is it going to be restricted? Um, with increasingly cheaper prices of air travel, many tourists might want to be able to go there. Um, a lot of news and advertising might make people again want to go there. So really think about the future when you're also evaluating them. And the best kind of A-star essays are the ones that know the facts, but then also take an opinion and think about who is successful, why, who are the key players, what's happening in the future, what are the different challenges of the management strategies, which management strategies link to which of the different impacts. So there are a few 20 mark questions for you to have a go at. I think they might be on the um, specimen papers or like previous past papers, if not ask your teacher for one, but kind of one is saying climate change is the biggest threat to Antarctica, to what extent do you agree? So you could have a go at doing that for 20 marks. Um, so yeah, so good luck on that. That um, I think it's everything to do with Antarctica and global commons. And so for me at The Curious Geographer, good luck. Lots of mind maps for you to do. Hopefully you all didn't do this in one go, like it was a monster of a video. But um, yeah, any questions, put them in the comments below and I can help you with that as well.